All right, I'm going to ask you guys to stand right now. And I know you were just standing for worship, but I'm going to ask you to stand again for the reading of God's word. Um, and I'm, you don't have to read this with me. I'm just going to read it to you. Um, but I just want you on the alert and honoring this section of God's word because it's so precious to us. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. How many of you are hearing the King James anyway? Yep. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to God's name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast of food for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil and my cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Do you see why it's so precious? Go ahead and have a seat. There's two things I want you to notice about this right away before we get into anything else. Just scan down through that, everything we just read. Number one, do you, do you see the character in the psalm that's never explicitly named? It's not, it's not said. The sheep, do you notice that? The sheep, it, the, the word sheep isn't in there. Why? Because King David, who wrote this, saw himself as the sheep. And he writes this from the perspective of the sheep. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And every time I say sheep today, it's going to sound weird because sheep in the English language is both singular and plural, and it always sounds wrong. Amen? But I'm just going to keep at it. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. That means King David, mighty warrior King David, saw himself as a sheep, which is wild to me. The next thing I want you to see is the sheep does nothing in this psalm. The sheep merely receives. The sheep is taken care of. The sheep is blessed. The sheep is led. The sheep has peace. The sheep gets food in the presence of its enemies. The sheep even gets to live in the house of the Lord forever. Think Beverly Hills Mansion there. Gets to live in the house of the Lord forever. The sheep does nothing but eat and poop, probably. Right? And get blessed. And, and that's, that's the hidden message of this entire psalm. Is that to be a sheep means you have a shepherd and you merely receive from the shepherd. And it's going to mess with us just a little bit. We're going to get into that later. First, I want to show you the picture of this painting here. Um, here's a, it's an ancient painting of a, a shepherd. Notice the sheep is on its shoulders. This is from <clears throat> the ancient Christian catacombs from 200 to 300 AD. The, 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 the Christians, the, 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 the early church, they would bury their dead in these catacombs that they built and dug under the ground. And they would build enough space down there where they could have these smallish funeral services and bring the church and bring the family of God around and they could set these people to rest and they would have little worship services in there. And so the Christians, the ancient Christians, they would, they would paint these paintings on the wall just to remind them of precious promises of God in his word. And there's several paintings if you look at it historically. But the most popular painting throughout the, the ancient Christian catacombs is this one right here. The picture of a shepherd with a lamb over its shoulder shows up so often it's the most popular painting throughout the catacombs. What does that tell you? It, just, it tells you that this image that King David came up with, and I say he came up, came up with through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and then it gets picked up over and over and over again. But this image of God as our shepherd and us as his sheep receiving from him was precious to the early Christians. And for several of you, it has been precious as well. So sheep are pretty passive. Again, they eat grass and poop, right? Um, they're blessed, they're protected, they're at peace. They're given a banquet, but they are sleepy and they are static and they're doing pretty much nothing. They're led into a wonderful life, 
but they don't do any work in order to get themselves there, yes? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says it like this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not by your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of your works, so that no one can boast. This is the essence of the gospel. If you've been here at Grace before, <clears throat> we refer to this verse quite a bit, that you cannot do anything to save you. That you cannot do anything to clean up your past. You cannot do anything to heal you of your bad habits. You cannot do anything to get yourself to heaven. You can't achieve it because it's already been achieved for you. And if that's not been taught well to you, I'll just tell you that if you're waiting to come to Jesus to get your life cleaned up first or to balance the scales of all the things that you have done in your dark past, the scales will never balance and you will never come to him. You'll just keep waiting. And the truth of God's word is that Jesus balanced the scales for you on the cross. The word of God says that when Jesus took on the cross, that he didn't die for his own guilt and his own sin. He took on your guilt and your sin. And he paid for it. And it's, it's debt paid. Okay? And so when you come to Jesus, you're not saying, I want to I repay the debt myself and balance the scales myself. What you're saying is, Jesus, I receive your gift. I receive your gift. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. Some of you have known Christians before who thought that they earned their, their salvation and then they went around judging other Christians who were not as moral as they were. That should never ever happen in the kingdom of God. It's, it's because of a core misunderstanding of the gospel. Charles Spurgeon, a pastor from uh, England, classic pastor, he said this. He said, before man can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd. He must first feel himself to be a sheep by nature. He must relate to a sheep in its foolishness, its dependency, and in the warped nature of its will. Thank you, Charles Spurgeon. So we are like sheep, and he gives us three different ways that we are like sheep. So I'm going to list these out for you, and we're going to test them by God's word. He says, first off, sheep are foolish. They're dependent and they have a warped will. Now, just say this for you. So sometimes in messages, like I've done my study before I get to the message. Sometimes I will explain how I got to a conclusion. I'll kind of show you my work, like in math. Sometimes I just go there. Today, I'll give you a little bit of showing you my work. Here's the thing. You don't just read a quote like this and just believe it. You got to go to the scripture first. And there are things that you will read. I'm just got to tell you this. There are things that you will read about shepherds and sheep. And, and, and there are things that you will read that will tell you Christians are like sheep because of X. And they'll give you all kinds of characteristics of sheep and say, that means that's like you. Like sheep stink, just like you, maybe. You know what I'm saying? Like, we can't just look at every single characteristics. What we got to do is we got to look at what the Bible says the key characteristics of a sheep are that are like us, okay? We gotta let the Bible draw those conclusions for us. So let's test out what Spurgeon said. Number one, sheep are foolish, Luke 15, four. We're gonna see if the Bible backs that one up. If a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, this is a classic parable of Jesus. And he's talking about, he's talking about, what a good shepherd is. He means himself and he means pastors sometimes, parents sometimes. He says there's this, there's this thing when one gets lost, you go and you search for the one that's lost. And we love this parable. But notice what he assumes we all know. We, he assumes we all know that sheep get themselves lost all the time. Do you ever get yourself lost? Because sheep do. Is that one like us? Yes or no? Of course it is. We get lost all the time. We are a lost people. We are part of the lost sheep of Israel, Jesus calls us. Um, sheep are known for this. Um, I, I was reading one commentator, and he said that there was a local legend that there had been 1,500 sheep in a single flock, and one of those sheep went falling off a cliff, and the other 1,500 followed. And he said, 400 died, and 1,100 survived because... 
the 400 down below broke their fall. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds fun. Right? Like, like, this is what sheep do. There's a, a, another person said that there had been a legend where uh, a, a, a shepherd, as the sheep were coming out of the pen, he put like a rod across a certain distance up so that the sheep had to jump over top of it in order to get out of the pen. And then once the first few had jumped, he removed the rod and they all jumped after coming out. Because sheep are so follow the leader, no matter who you are, that they will just follow and they will get themselves lost and confused. Is it possible that we have a nature that gets us lost? Is it possible that we follow every social media influencer out there to a surfacey life and mental health deterioration? Is that possible? Is it possible that we follow politicians into tribalism and 24 by 7 fear and despair about the world around us? Is it possible that we follow our sex drives into addiction? Is it possible that we follow our appetites into obesity? Is it possible that we follow every friend, we follow the world around us? Is it possible that we spend our entire lives getting ourselves lost over and over and over again? I think this one fits. Any sheep out there? Bah. Bah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right on cue. Thank you, Pepper. Matthew 9, 36 says that we're dependent. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. There's this, this moment of compassion. Jesus looks and he sees a crowd and he just knows, he can intuit, he can, he can sense, he uses his godlike knowledge to see into their souls, and he knows how lost they are, how confused and helpless they are. Why? Because they don't have a shepherd. And when we don't have the right leader in our lives, when we don't have a good leader in our lives, we are confused and we are helpless. We are just by nature helpless people. And this is really going to mess with you today if you're an overachiever. If you're a perfectionist today, this whole concept of sheep and the fact that we are dependent, it's going to mess with you. Are you a high performer today? Are you self-sufficient, independent, strong in and of yourself today? And I don't need anybody today. This is going to this is going to mess with you because Jesus says if they don't have the right shepherd in their life, they are like lost sheep, confused, and helpless. Helpless from what? Helpless in the midst of attack because attack is coming. Attack is always coming, and you need to be protected from it. Jesus is the one who gives that. So Jesus kind of comes in and says, hey, because you're dependent, you need to know that you're dependent. If you don't know you're dependent on me, you're going to screw up your life because you're going to try to follow yourself, or what you're really going to do is you're going to end up following somebody else who is not Jesus, not nearly as true, kind, or holy, Yes? So we need him. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 3, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Maybe as a kid, you heard that growing up and you wondered what that meant. To be poor in spirit means that I am not rich in my spirituality. I'm not enough. I don't bring enough to the table. I'm poor in spirit and I need more of him. I don't have enough morality. I don't have enough patience. I don't have enough joy. I don't have enough of any of the things that I need to have. I'm poor in spirit. But it's when I come and I admit that to Jesus Christ that all of a sudden things start to go better. He also said in Mark 2, 17, it says, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people need a doctor. I have come, Jesus says, he's kind of declaring his mission here. He says, I've come to call those, not, I have not come to call those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Some of us think we're righteous. Some of us think we're okay. And that self-reliance is killing you. When you come before Jesus, you come to him humbly. You come to him poor. You come to him, I've got nothing without you, Jesus. Because you can be dependent and not know you're dependent. It's the you knowing you're dependent that's a huge, huge thing because you'll follow him. 
The third thing Spurgeon told us was that a sheep has a warped will. Look at Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on Jesus the sins of us all. Maybe you've heard that verse before. But we have all, this is, this is like saying every single one of us has sinned. Every single one of us has followed our own path throughout this life. And we've walked away from God's better path. Right? It's like the, the, the Psalm 23 said, said, he leads me in right paths for his namesake. But we, we walk away from the right paths to follow our own paths. Yes? It's like there's something inside of us, like in our soul, it's like an autopilot. I heard a pastor say one time that, that like if, say you had some kind of advanced speedboat that had an autopilot feature, and it was always going to go this direction, you could grab the steering wheel and crank it a different direction temporarily. But as soon as you got tired and you let go of the steering wheel, guess where it's going to go? Right back where it was. We are this way. So when the fall happened and sin entered the picture and the curse of sin entered our souls, the scripture says, your autopilot got screwed up. Your autopilot reads selfishness every single time. Your autopilot reads my way for my good every single time. Your autopilot reads rage and anger and cruelty and impatience and greed every single time. And you might for a moment be able to crank that dude this way, but it's going to go right back. How do we fix that? Like Spurgeon said, we have a warped will. Even as Christians, our autopilot is screwed up. After we're saved, we still struggle against it. There's an old hymn called Come Thou Fount, and it says it like this. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God that I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. So what's this old hymn saying? There's a reason that this hymn has been so popular for so many generations because those words really ignite a fire in our soul, don't they? Like we, we, we know that's us. Like even if we're a Christian, even if you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you know, it doesn't take you long before you're prone to wonder, before sometimes you fear, where will I be in a year if Jesus doesn't save me, if Jesus doesn't keep me on the path? Do you know how desperately needy you are that he would keep you on the path? And, and I, I love the second set of lines. It's, it's like, take my heart, God, and seal it, would you? Would you like put it in a lockbox, please? Because I'm going to screw this thing up. We just take my heart, put it in that lockbox. I, I make it to heaven. God, will you, like, will you guarantee I make it to heaven? That's what he's saying. The, the scripture says that he has given you the Holy Spirit as a seal for the day of redemption. Amen. Right? Like, like you are sealed. If that's your heart and should be your heart, even as a Christian, you are prone to wonder. You have a warped will and you need Jesus every step of the way as your shepherd. Where's she? Where's my sound effect at? Let's go. Okay. All right. So this is kind of a depressing picture so far. Yes? Foolish, dependent, warped will. Thank you, Jesus. Right? <laughs> then, then what's this about then and, and, and why? And, and is there any good news here? Well, let's go to a fourth one here. You are significant also. And that's the piece Spurgeon didn't put in there. And I'm not saying I got anything on Spurgeon, but I'm just got to get some good news going for us. Yes? You are significant. You are a significant sheep. Why are you significant? Because he chose you. Why are you significant? Because he found you lovable. Why are you significant? Because you matter. And who do you matter to? You matter to him. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. Do you see the imagery? He will gently lead the mother's sheep with their young. He found you lovable and he chose you. That's, that's what it comes down to. John 15, 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. He found you lovable and he chose you. God looked on you in that way. And why did he choose you? Is it because you bring a lot to the table? 
I mean, some of us had that day where we, we gave our lives to Christ and we started coming to a church and the, the thoughts started to creep up. If you'll admit it today that like, I, I think this is a good day for God. God got me. Way to go, God. You got me on your team, dude. I bet you're really happy up there for all I bring to the table, all my skills, all my talents, all my abilities. Have you seen my 401k? God, like, aren't you excited? It doesn't work like that. You brought nothing to this table. Like, you know what? Here's the thing about sheep. There's no job description or there's no job interview to be a sheep. You don't walk into a room and get assessed for everything that you bring. And if you pass the test, you get into the kingdom of God. It doesn't work like that. And some of you guys might want it to work like that, right? Like I would like to be affirmed and know that I like passed the test and God wanted me and I'm really bringing something to the team. It's like, nope, none of that's true. He chose you because he found you lovable, full stop. He chose to love you. That's it. Um, last fall, uh, we decided to get a puppy. And I will not put her picture up on the screen because it will overwhelm you with cuteness. Um, and I'll just lose control of the room. So um, it's Millie. Her, it's her name. And back in the fall, uh, Linda's like looking for pictures online and breeders online. stuff. So she finds Millie. And we have to drive to Tulsa. And so we get in the car, we drive to Tulsa, it's where the breeder's at, and they meet us in this big, massive parking lot, and we get to meet Millie in the back of this SUV, and um, she was super hyper, super squeaky, and like scratched at my neck. And I'm, li I'm thinking, like, I'm not even sure that this is the right one. And Linda, <laughs> as soon as we got back in the vehicle to drive for home, Linda's like, oh yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and here's the thing. Millie doesn't bring a lot to the table. Can I just say that? Um, she poops and we clean it. She gets dirty and we bathe her. She digs holes in my backyard and I have to refill them in with dirt from somewhere. She broke her leg last, last fall also after we'd had her for a little while. And, and I mean, we were just basket cases about it. And I think we took out a $100,000 mortgage on the house just to pay for the, the repair to her leg. I think it was like a bionic robotic leg that she got when she was done. It was so expensive, you know, but we didn't care. What had she given us? What had she accomplished? Nothing. We had chosen her because we found her lovable. Full stop. And we do that, do we not? And I don't know that she's worth all that. <laughs> and she could have taken a part-time job, even, even like a paper route to contribute to the budget. She hasn't done any of that. She doesn't clean up after herself. She doesn't do chores. I just turn the vacuum cleaner on and she gets scared and runs to another room. So that's not looking good for the future. We found her lovable and we chose her. If you are one of Jesus' sheep today, it's because the great shepherd of our souls looked on you and found you lovable, and he chose you, full stop. If we can do it as human beings, why don't we think God can do that? Why do we, why do we judge God to be less in love than we are as human beings with our dogs? Uh, Romans 8, 5, 5, 8, 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his children, now we call him Abba Father. So you were chosen, you were adopted into his family. Chosen and adopted, and you, you now have the status of, of a family member, right? So I knew this foster family, and last year, last January, they're, they're in Florida, and I got to meet them, got to know them, and, and they had several foster kids already, but there was an infant, and the infant was in an emergency situation they had no family to go to. And so they, they gave this family, this infant, to take care of just temporarily until we find a permanent home for the infant. And several weeks, maybe even a few months went by, and the husband was relating this story to me, and, and he turns to his wife, and he's like, so 
you know, what kind of a family do you think the child is going to go to? And how quickly do you think this is going to happen? And she looks at him and says, this baby has become my child. I know it. And as soon as she said that, discussion over. She had looked on this child. She had found this child lovable and adopted it. And so for the rest of this baby's life, she is going to wipe its runny nose and buy Christmas presents and birthday cards and, and be disappointed by this child and pay loads of money for this child and not get any of that return on investment back. Yes? Where are the parents at? Like, it's not why we do it. We just do it because we choose to love. And she found this child lovable, and so she chose it, and she legally adopted it. And, and she'd jump in front of a bus today for this child if that's what was needed, yes? How does that happen? So I, we'll say things like, blood is thicker than water. And you know what we're implying? We're implying that like, ah, there's some kind of scientific whatever that happens, and if they're your blood, then you're gonna love them and all this kind of stuff. That doesn't explain her. She looked at this child, found it lovable, and adopted it, chose it for life, the investment that she'll make. Is it possible that you've been chosen by God in the exact same way? Why do we look at the heart of God and think that he is somehow more hard-hearted than this human woman? No, he's, he's so far beyond that love. I mean, he's, he's given us a taste in our humanity of the miracle of love and choosing that can happen, but he is so much more. God is so good. Luke 12, 31. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Uh, this is Jesus talking. It's one of my favorite lines ever of Jesus. He says, so don't be afraid, little flock. Because <laughs> they were afraid. So don't be afraid, little flock. Because it gives the father happiness to give you the kingdom. It gets him thrilled to lead you along. It gets him thrilled to bless you and protect you, to give you his kingdom. Like he's decided that's, that's part of his way to happiness. Like, can you believe that? Don't be afraid, little flock, because I know you're afraid. Don't be afraid, little flock. I know there's, I know there's bad things out there. I, I know that you're a little control freakish sometimes. Yes? And your fears rise up. Don't be afraid, little flock, because the father's your shepherd. It gives him great happiness to give you all things. Don't be afraid, little flock. Right? Like, I, I know you want to be a perfectionist. I know you want to earn this on your own, but you're never going to. Don't be afraid. Just rest. Just have peace. Just trust him because he loves you. I mean, these are the terms Jesus uses to describe how the whole thing works. He says it gives him happiness to do this. I want you to imagine there's a palace, great palace, innumerable rooms, and let's say in this palace, there are, there are places that you can rent out, right? And the king is there and, and the royal family is there and, and there are friends there and there are servants there. Let's say you rent out a room in this place. Guess what? You're there because you paid for it. You're there because you're paying rent. And so you've earned a room and they owe you a room. But as soon as you stop paying, what happens? you're out. See, some of you have come to God's kingdom that way, and you think you're a tenant, that as long as you pay, and as long as you keep paying, then you get a space. And as soon as you give up, and as soon as something goes wrong in your life, you are done. And that is not the way the Bible paints that picture. Imagine that you're a servant in that house. And you get to be in the house and you get to be around this amazing family in this amazing place. As long as you serve, as long as you do the things that you're supposed to do and you produce the things that you hit the quotas and you do all of the stuff. And look at me, I did all of the stuff. As long as you keep serving, you get to be in the house. But man, if you stop and if you don't make quota, you don't produce the things that you came here to produce 
you're no good anymore. That's the mindset of a servant. Some of you know that when Jesus came, he said, I have not called you servants. I have called you friends. It's different. Now let's imagine that this king, in the middle of the night, gets woken up. Two in the morning, because that's the worst time to be woken up, right? And let's say it's one of these servants, and the servant wants a drink of water. Hey, king, would you get me a drink of water at two in the morning? What happens to that servant? Off with his head. Who could possibly wake up a king in the middle of the night for a drink of water? His child could. Daddy, can I have a drink of water? Two in the morning? The king of that whole country will immediately get up. And he'll get his child a drink of water. Do you see it? See, what, what role we put ourselves in in the kingdom matters today. Do you see yourself as a child? Do you see yourself as a sheep who needs its shepherd? Do you see yourself 100% dependent on him? Or did you come into the church and you were ready to do things for God? You came into the church and I'm going to earn my place for God. And God's going to be happy that I'm here because I'm going to produce all of this stuff. Do you see how you, you get yourself in the wrong it's, it's in the wrong relationship. It's in the wrong covenant. That's not what he presents. And see, he's so, he's so big on this. Even when the Pharisees, do you remember the Pharisees would come to Jesus? And they wanted to come to him through this lens of self-reliance and, and I'm going to keep God's word myself and I'm going to do great things for the kingdom. Aren't you impressed, Jesus? And he says, he says, as long as your righteousness does not exceed what the Pharisees have, you won't enter God's kingdom, he says. One of the most terrifying statements in all of scripture. And what's he saying? He's saying their little righteousness on their own is nothing. They need the righteousness that only Jesus could provide them. They needed to come into the relationship the way that God was offering the relationship. Well, I want to spin it my way. You don't get to spin it your way. You are a significant sheep who matters to a God who found you lovable and chose you full stop. And that's how you have to come to him. John 10, 26. Jesus said, but you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. So Jesus introduces the question of, are you one of his? My sheep listen to my voice, he says. I know them and they follow me. It's innate in them. Like they just know me, right? Like we're in relationship. I'll give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. If they're my sheep. Now this is where it might get wonky for you. You're like, wait, I thought we were just chosen. You are. You're all chosen. The question is, will you let yourself be chosen? Will you? Because Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. That's what Revelation tells us. He's knocking. Will you open the door? It, it's weird Sometimes there's things that are work that don't feel like work, and there's things that is not work that feels like work. And I know my grammar was wrong in that. Some of you, <laughs> I lost you. So we're one of the things that we're going to preach in the coming weeks as we go through Psalm 23 is it's going to say that he makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters or still waters, depending on your version. And one of the things that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Sabbath. We're going to talk about taking a day off. Isn't it weird that right there in Genesis 1, God comes right in as he creates the world, and on the seventh day he rests. And he's like, and my people are going to rest. 
And I need my people to rest. And it's right there in the Ten Commandments as well. I need you to take a Sabbath and to keep it holy. And I need you to stop and I need you to slow down. Why? Because maybe the God of the universe knew that we'd eventually get to a culture that would never, ever stop producing. And that we'd be going crazy with all of the stress that was never ending. And just, I'm going to get up and make the donuts again. And that we need to stop. Because what are we doing? We're worshiping the gods of this world. We're worshiping the gods of money and career and title and education and all of the stuff. And God said, I want you to stop like a rhythm of six days and you're going to take a day off. Is that work? No, that's not work to take a day off. But it feels like work to us, does it not? Why? Because we have to disconnect ourselves from this grind and this culture and it messes with us to do it. Do you see the shepherd coming into your life and saying, I've got a better way for you? I got a better way. And it might feel hard. That doesn't make it work. I want you to chill. You're, you're my child and I love you, so I want you to be healthy. Your mental health actually matters. Your character and your joy and your peace actually matter to me. There's so much you're going to find in this faith that God presents to us that is all about ministering to your heart and giving you a better soul and shaping you. This is, this is the way that it works. And Jesus is knocking on the door to your heart and he wants to love you. Would you guys stand? The question is, will you let him? And the question is, will you let it be his way and not yours? I want to do something before we leave. And we'll do this sometimes. So I want to offer you a chance to reach out to Jesus Christ for the first time in your life and to surrender to him. And I'm going to walk you through a prayer. And if you've never surrendered to Jesus, not for real. I'm going to base this prayer. It's on a passage in the book of Romans. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And that picture, that's you opening the door and letting him in. It's not you earning anything, right? It's not, not, it's not you making anything happen. It's you letting Jesus come in. And he's the one who will shepherd you. He's the one who will change you. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I'm going to lead us in this prayer, and we'll all say the words out loud one phrase at a time. And it's not the words that matter, guys. It's, it's your heart. And the God of the universe can see your heart. And whether or not you mean it, whether or not you're truly surrendering to him, he sees all of that. I also want to speak to some of you because some of you have gone through things like the sinner's prayer before, or, or you got baptized before, you went through a confirmation class before, and it just never took for you. And you would tell me today, you're like, I, I've been going to church for a long time, but I don't feel like ever, it ever took. And this might be why. Because maybe what you took on was what it was to be a tenant in the king's house or a servant in the king's house, trying to earn your way, trying to keep your way, trying to impress God, and you've got to be done with it. You've got to come to Jesus the way he wants. He's shepherd. You've got to be a sheep. And so maybe you're going to surrender to him in this way, in his way. It matters. And, and then the last group of you I'll just address is some of you got started on the road with Jesus and you understood in the beginning. And after so many years, you don't even know when it happened. You got onto this performing for God road. And you got onto this like every single day guilt trip road. I'm not moral enough. I'm not good enough. And God's mad at me road. And you need to re-surrender to him. And you need to see yourself in that right forgiven way. Let's pray. Go ahead and bow your heads. Close your eyes. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. You are king of my life. You are my shepherd. 
would you shepherd me? Please choose me, God. Please love me no matter what I do. And I want to change. I want to follow you. So would you fill me with your spirit? Give me power. Give me the ability to walk in your way. I love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.